stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. The dark, the dark is trying to roll over my bones. When sorrow comes, it's still the joy.
you should have an information card. Um, if you want to know how to get plugged in, uh, if you want to speak to the senior pastor, uh, myself, Travis, Pastor John, uh, you can just check one of the boxes at the bottom, and if you will, just leave it at the table right back there at the back, and uh, we'll be more than happy to, uh, to reach out to you. So as we continue to worship, uh, the scripture says that we're to bring our tithes and offerings. That we're to bring them. I mean, God's already blessed you with the provision, but the scripture says that we're to bring that tithe and offering. So as we continue to worship, you'll see families come up and, and bring in their tithes and offerings, praying with their kids, and, and just truly teaching our families how to worship in that way. Because the reality of the situation, if we don't, who will? So, so don't miss out on that. And um, as we continue to talk about the Word of God, so I want you to, to think of the, the Word is referenced in three ways. So as far as you've got the book, the Word of God. It's right there. So that's one reference to the Word of God. Then you've got the reference of the message in the Word of God. And then as you continue to read that Word, and it comes alive in your life, and, and, and you hear the, the very God of the universe speaking to you, that's that, that rhema Word of God. That, that Word that God thank you, because I needed to hear from you. So as we uh, continue to, to study the Word of God, where's it at in your life? I mean, is it, yeah, I believe that's the, the Word. Or do you believe that the message that's written inside of it was for you? Maybe not. But what's God saying to you right now? Because that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. My favorite questions are, what's he saying? What are we doing? Because God speaks to his people. My prayer is that he speaks to us today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, Father, my prayer is, Lord, that you would just give us ears to hear the prompting of the Holy Spirit of God. What are you saying to this church individually? And what are you saying to us collectively, God? Lord, where you're going, can we join you? Because it's in your presence where our faith makes strong. It's in your presence, God, that our enemies are defeated. It's in your presence, God, where we're healed, where we're set free. So, Father, we want nothing more today than your presence. So, Father, draw on our hearts. <coughs> Lord, I pray that you'll receive our offering again. And our worship is a, is a sweet offering unto you. Father, we love you. Just ask that you come and have it the praises of your people. Because that's what we need. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. God, you're the only one who's never failed us.
close our eyes and think about the day and the moment that you and God met. I'm not talking when you just said, come, come and be in my heart. I'm talking about the day that you and the Holy Spirit had an encounter. And at that moment, your life was completely different. Do you remember what that moment was like? When you decided, I'm going to build my life on you, God. I'm going to put my trust in you alone. so fast and your eyes had water in them for no reason other than you were just in love with the creator God if you've never had that experience I want to invite you because God is here can't explain why we've changed the set other than God wants to do something in someone's life. I'm not talking about some just emotional thing. God is here to do something. He is here to wreck somebody's whole agenda today. So if you never ever fully committed that you know that you know that you know the creator God is yours. I'm going to offer up something to you. Just worship with us. And ask Him. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else. And if you can't remember the time that God pulled at your heart and God held your heart. And you knew that you knew that you knew. And you never had that encounter. I'm going to offer you the same thing. Because if you're in here and God's done something in your life, we're going to sing this whole song again. I'm going to invite you to worship with me. Because I can't help but thank God that my life is built on the firm foundation. That my trust is put in the one who created this whole thing. So God, yes, you are worthy of every song we can sing. Yes, yes. This song isn't good enough for you, but it's what we got. My life wasn't worth saving, but in your eyes it was. So I'm just going to invite you. If you want to come to the front, you can come to the front. We have pastors here. If you want to do it in your chair, you can do it in your chair. There's people around. But we are in a group of loving Christians who the creator of the universe is in this atmosphere. Amen. I'm not going to beg you. I'm not going to plead with you. We're going to keep singing these songs to this amazing God, but if you want it, come get it. So we're going to sing it again.
is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Sing Jesus.
gotta get this right here. You gotta get this. Amen. You can't miss this right here. Amen. The name is above all names. Amen. Amen. The king above all kings. Amen. Not just a mighty warrior.
Well, maybe let's give it six more weeks. Six more weeks. That's what it is. Six more weeks. We get it fixed. I'll be able to go back to it and and, and let's let's try it again. So sure enough, six weeks later, here I am bench pressing, and it's like, you know. But now, now when I start doing this, it's like, hey, oh, you know, this ain't good. And when I say bench pressing, I'm talking about a 25 on each side. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, well done, man. 50 pounds, young man. I mean, I did more than that when I was like in seventh, eighth grade when I started, you know. And I mean, I love to think that I made some progress in between here. I mean, but it's, it's crazy, you know. So, so I, I continue to do this, and I, I was like, oh, okay, it's my bed. That's what it is. It's my bed. Let's go spend three, five thousand dollars, you know. We we'll get to bed, you know. And then we get to bed, and then bed. It's the pillow. It's the pillow. I forgot to get the pillow. So I gotta go get the pillow. So I get the pillow and I'm like, it ain't the pillow. So I'm like, all right, maybe I just don't sleep on that side for a little bit, give it some rest. Cause it's like, you know, now I'm at the point where I wake up and I'm like, honey, I need you to push my shoulder back in the joint. I mean like, amen. So I'm like, what in the world? What in the world? I mean, surely it can't be that bad. So after 15 months, I finally go to the doctor. <laughs> now I'm talking about, I ain't been able to do a push-up off my knees, brother, in 15 months. I hate to say that, but it is what it is, what it is. So I finally go to the doctor, and he's like, we're going to have to do surgery. I'm like, all right. And I'm like, well, what is it? Well, it's a partial tear in your bicep tendon. I'm like, my bicep tendon? I mean, I, I can do curls. It, that don't bother me a bit, you know? So. I was like, Doc, look, you know, let's, let's talk. So, so I'm sitting there in his office, and it's crazy, you know. I've read a brochure. i seen it, you know, six, eight pictures. And I'm like, Doc, here's the deal. So, so I grab one bone that I think's a, a shoulder blade, and I grab another bone, so I stick them together. And I'm like, all right, man, right here's the deal. And he said, oh, it's your hip. <laughs> and I'm like, he was like, you're open to hip. I was like, all right. Well, maybe, you know, Google a brochure and six pictures won't do it. You know what I'm saying? So I go, and, uh, and sure enough, I have surgery. And, um, but it was a labrum, uh, rotator cuff, uh, scapulus, and ding, 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 whatever that word is. Um, so it was, it was like three or four times worse than, than we initially thought. So we have surgery. You know, now I'm, uh, what, three, three, three and a half, two and a half weeks. Yeah. Two and a half weeks into this thing. So uh, the doc says I have to wear this for six weeks. And I'm thinking, I mean, I'm, with my age, with my health, I mean, we should be able to negotiate this a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I mean, because the surgery went great. I mean, yes, it was a lot worse than what we anticipated. But there was no pain. He fixed me. So we're good. Now, now I can go back to everything that I did before, you know what I'm saying? So I mean, you know, Monday I, I, I go to the doctor and, and I'm like, you know, how are things going, Doc? And he's like, well, we're going to get your stitches out. And I was like, can we start negotiating on this thing right here? And he was like, no. I'm like, you know, I mean, I need you, I need you to say things the way that I'm, I'm looking at it, you know. And, and it was just crazy. He was like, you know, matter of fact, George, you need to sleep it. And I was like, oh, Lord, no, we just go there. Sleep in this thing. Now, imagine this. You're, you're on your back. Your hands above your heart. So that joker is like that table. No. I'm talking about no blood. You know what I'm saying? So, so you got to sleep with the band like this. I sleep late enough, but I'm like, oh, Lord, this ain't good, you know. So anyhow, you know, I went to San Antonio last week. So I come back Friday, and I, I'm glad... So, so the pillows that I had at the motel room, you know, you stack two of them up trying to make one, and, and then it's like, you know, because they wrap around your head, it's not, it's not my pillow. So all night, I'm, you know, one arm, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to sleep, and I'm like, you know, so I, so I get home Friday, and I'm like, my bed, my pillow, tonight's going to be a good night. So I'm like, <laughs> I really don't have to wear this thing, not tonight, you know what I'm saying? This one night. So I took it off. Sure enough, I woke up Saturday morning, I was in major pain. And I'm talking about I was hurting. And it was like, wow, you know? I mean, 
I was doing great. So, so wow, I mean, one night, I mean, it wasn't the first night. No, I've done this. I've done this a couple of times. Amen. Right, so it, it didn't catch up with me the first time. You know what I'm saying? Not the second. Not the third. Not the fourth. Not the fifth. I mean, like it was like eight nights. You know what I'm saying? I my wife down. But on that ninth night, it caught up with me. So you know, I'm 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 thinking about you know the doctor. He's not gonna make me sleep in this thing. Matter of fact, I've got to go up to Denver and uh, over at Beaver Creek in a couple of weeks. And I'm thinking, let's get it on. <laughs> let's get our skis on, you know. The doctor's like, go if you can if that's what you want to do. I mean, if you tear it loose, we'll just go back and fix it again. Another 50 grand. I'm cool with it, you know. <laughs> well, you know. So, so, anybody got any good words of wisdom? Seriously, I need you to know. Listen to your doctor. Listen to your doctor. Listen to your wife. Amen. Yes. But now this is the crazy part. But most of your body, your body's telling you. But this ain't my first surgery. I mean, I didn't even do physical therapy when they done this one. But look where it got you. And I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> this, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, how important. Yeah. Look where it got you. <laughs> but I mean, it ain't my day, y'all man. But I mean, seriously, any other good words of wisdom from anybody? Be still. If we had some, you wouldn't listen. What's that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so, so think about that. Be still, now, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about this, and I'm sharing my ignorance with you. But imagine what the, the true doctor, Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, says to us. Talking about the recovery. Now, whether it's your spiritual state, whether you've never asked him to come into your heart before, whether you're lost, what is he saying to us? And and you know, one thing that God really challenged me about this week: Do I even want to hear what he has to say, or am I more, more worried about him hearing what I need to say? Because to be able to hear first, there has to be that desire to hear. It's like me and the doctor saying, if he would just. Listen to me. And don't you know it's almost comical? Here this dude is with a hip in his hand thinking, oh, I got it figured out. <laughs> he was thinking, if I could just get him to listen to me. So, I mean, as I'm, as I'm telling that story, that's just that's real life. That's just my real life. But, I mean, is there anybody else, please don't raise your hand, that can identify with that in their life? Because, you know, as we talked about the Word of God <coughs> being a, a book, yes, that's, that's God's Word. And me, me basically being over here that, yes, I believe that's God's Word, but it really doesn't relate to me. Because that's, that's one thing as far as the, the message that we're going to talk about today. It would be easy for me to say, if I had my shoulder operated on, I would never do that. I mean, you, you, you're going to be able to say that. But then as we get in here and we read the message today, will you be able to identify with it? Because there's one thing about it. If you can't identify with it, it's not going to make sense to you. So when I say that, I can sit here and I can guarantee you probably 90% of the eyes that are looking at me right now are saying, that moron. <laughs> if, he just, if he just listened to the doctor, you know what I'm saying? But just because you think I need to listen to the doctor, doesn't mean that I think I need to listen to the doctor. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So the reality of the situation, until I believe I need to listen to the doctor, the information is irrelevant, doesn't pertain to me. Does that make sense? Yes. So, I mean, as we get into God's Word this morning, in the Scripture, it rocked my world this week. I mean, in a, in a lot of different ways. So, um, so as far as I'm going to be coming out of Judges chapter 7, and I don't know about y'all, but, uh, but i got a few pictures to show and uh, to really bring it home for me. And uh, as far as where we're at in Scriptures, um, the Israelites, which are God's chosen people, the enemy had come upon them. Nathan, if you don't mind, can you show that uh, that picture with the swarm of locusts? So I want to ask you about your life. Where are you at? 
And when I say that, imagine this poor soul, this elephant, with swarms of locusts on him. Now, can I ask you today, have you ever felt like the enemy has come upon you like this? I mean, the scriptures teach us that our adversaries run around like a roaring lion <coughs> looking for somebody to destroy. Amen? Yeah. Not, not, not just like bite to devour. So, I mean, it's not that he wants to, to maim you. He wants to take you out of the game. Amen? Amen? But can I tell you that sometimes we give the devil too much credit. Amen. Amen? So, so when I say that, is it is it my fault that I took the brace off that I'm hurting? Yep. Or that? Or that is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been under attack this week, I'm telling you. I mean, I mean, really. I mean, it's, it's really your perception of reality. Now, you just got to keep it in... in, in uh, in mind, the perception is such a tricky thing. Sometimes we can dress things up a little bit because I need it to look like this. That way I can justify my actions this way. So as far as can I, can I ask you a question, honestly? Would you ever self-sabotage? Nah, I mean, for me, I mean, y'all can, can sit here and say, well, no, you would, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's possible. It's really possible. So as far as now, now today, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about your salvation. I'm going to assume that you know God, that you've, that you've accepted him as his Lord and Savior. So as far as today's message is going to be, you are his child. Now, now we're also going to talk a little bit about what it means to not be his child. And as far as the, the king of all kings, the name is above all names, how we can truly rejoice in that if you're a child of the living God. Amen? Amen. So as far as the, the Israelites, uh, just picture the, the elephant being God's children. You. And then the enemies trying to attack you. Now, can y'all count? Can you count? Can you count the love this way, please? Can anybody? Anybody? It would be safe to say the elephants outnumbered. Amen? So as far as truly, God's people in this time, when they went to look at the enemy, it was easy for them to see that they were outnumbered. Amen? So I'm going to come out of uh, Judges chapter 7, starting in verse 12. And uh, if you've ever seen a movie where, uh, where they start off with the end of the story, and then they go back and, and talk about what leads up to them. That's the message today. Amen. So as far as uh, the Israelites were uh, their enemies, as stated in Judges chapter 7, verse 12, it, say, uh, it says, uh, Now the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the people of the east were lying in the valley, as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number, as the sand by the seashore, in multitude. That's that that's just not that just that don't look like good odds. Amen. Yeah. But the thing about it is is God had spoken to this uh this guy named Gideon. And uh in Judges chapter seven, verse seven, it says, Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the three hundred men whom lapped I will save you, and deliver the Midianites in your hands, let all the other people go, every man to his place. So, as far as what they're seeing is this swarm of the enemy. But the crazy thing about that is God had, had spoke to this man. Now, they started off with 32,000 men, and then God said, not too many. Then, then, then y'all will think that y'all defeated the enemy on your own strength. Right. So I tell you what, if you don't mind, go to them and say, hey, if any of y'all are scared, Young, young, young head in the house. Now imagine this. If you got 32,000 people sitting in front of you, you say, hey man, if you're scared, go on to the house and 22,000 pack up and head in. <laughs> you know, 
I mean, <laughs> you know, you're looking at the storm, thinking, you know, that's what happened. That's what happened. And then, you know, the Lord spoke to, to Gideon, and he said, no, nah, still too many of you. There, there's 10,000 of y'all, but, but it's still too many. So go down to the river. Everybody go down to the river. And then take a drink of water out of the river. So he said, those that, that lap water like a dog, that, that bend over and, and stick their head in the river, leave them behind. And there were only 300 that went down on the knee and got water and were still able to watch as they drank the water. That's the ones you want. 300. So as you see, the, the enemy as swarms of locusts and their horses were as the, the sand of the seashore. You got 300 men that's ready to stand toe to toe with you. And then, starting in verse 20, so what happened was Gideon put 100 men in each company. So you had three companies of 100 men. Starting in verse 20, it says, Then the three companies blew the trumpets, broke the pitchers, they held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. <coughs> Excuse me. And every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. When the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. And I'm going to stop right there. So you've got the enemy in swarms against God's chosen people. 300 are ready to go to war. So he says, all right, no, 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 put the gun up. You're not going to need that. Matter of fact, don't even bring the sword. You're not, you're not going to, hey, hey, you know, if you can't, here, hold this torch in your left hand, and here's your trumpet for the right, because you're going to need this. So the scripture says that they went up with their torches in their hand, left hand, trumpets in the right, and they blew them. And all they said was the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And that big old mass of locusts. Scripture says that each companion sword turned against the other and they killed themselves. I mean, that's what the word says. That's what he said. I mean, that's, that's what he said. Amen. So when I ask you, do you feel like the enemy has come upon you? Nathan, if you don't mind showing these, uh, these other, other two pictures. If you feel like the enemy has come upon you, now here's a picture. It comes out of Judges, I mean, uh, what is it? Uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, verses 15 through 17. And this was a message that Brother uh, Travis preached on a couple of months ago. So the city is the Israelites, God's chosen people. So if you're looking in the background, surrounded is the army. Now they're not for you, they're against you. So I mean, in this scripture, the scripture says that, that Elijah's servant came out and he saw the enemy and said, now what are we going to do? I mean, it ain't looking good. And Elijah said, there's more of us than there is of them. So if you don't mind, show this next picture. So Elijah prayed, Father, open his eyes to the army that's encamped around us. If you're a child of the Most High God, you ain't lonely. That's right. And as far as if you have put the stress on yourself, feeling like you have to provide for yourself, you have to defend your family, you have to be the one that makes it all happen, give yourself a break. 
there is an army. Not, not just an army. The army. The Almighty. The all-powerful. Army of God. Surrounded around you. And it's with Him and through Him that all things are possible. So, I mean, if you feel like the army or the devil is, is chomping at your heels, give yourself a break. There's an army encamped around you. Amen. So now we're going to go to the beginning of the story. So we've seen the end. Let's go back to the beginning now. So I'm going to come out of Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Well, if, I, if you will, pull up the last verse of chapter 5 in Judges. I'm looking at the New King James Version. Which you don't have to. It says, so the last, the last, the last sentence. So the land had rest for 40 years. Can we all say that together? So the land had rest for 40 years. So when I ask you where you had your relationship with, with, with God, here's a period where they had rest for 40 years. Amen? Starting in Judges chapter 6, verse 1. Then here we go again. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So as far as, we're going to go through this a little, a little slow just to make sure people like me can really understand this. There was rest for 40 years. So when I ask you how are things, and you say, Great. <laughs> my prayer is that it did. But I know for me, I mean, my woman. <laughs> That's just me. You know what I'm saying? But thank God I ain't alone. Amen. So when I read these scriptures, I'm thinking, oh, how can I have my own leg? Am I am I related to basically saying, I would never do that? Oh man, I've been called great. Or no, 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 no. No, I've done been there, done that. I ain't gonna go back. Yeah. Because there's a lot of different approaches to this scripture. But if I can't identify with it, oh, that's, you know what I'm saying? What's a good word for, hey, well, I wish, I wish so and so was here, you know what I mean? We're here. So as far as the, the reality of the situation, God gave him rest for 40 years. Then he gave him over to the enemy for seven years. Now you got to keep in mind that seven is the number of completion. So when God gave them over to the enemy, there was something that he was wanting to complete in them. Not that he gave up on them, not that he rejected them, not that, that he didn't love them anymore. He was basically saying, hey, I'm right here. I want you. I've got everything you need. But if that's what you want, then I'll be here when you get back. So as far as in, uh, in verse 2 right there, it says the children of Israel. <laughs> Say the children of Israel. <laughs> The children of Israel is God's chosen people. I am the children of Israel when I read this. The children of Israel made for themselves dens, caves, and strongholds. Now when you translate that word strongholds, the dens and the caves were protected, protect them from the enemy. And the strongholds as well. So think about this. What are the dens and the caves and the strongholds that we have created in our own lives? Because the dens, the caves, and the strongholds were just safe havens. So, I mean, think about this right here for a minute. I've got a great job. I provide for my household. You know, maybe, maybe I've got a house, so I don't have to worry about anything. I've got a great 
great education. Can I tell you, church, it's a lot. It, I'm talking about it don't take but one second to get the trusted on created things versus the creator. Mm -hmm. So when the scripture says that they develop strongholds for themselves, they were the provider. They were the protector. So, I mean, has anybody ever been there? Are you there? And when I say that, where we get to put all this pride, in all honesty, on our old shoulders, that I can make it. Now, these are God's chosen people. But can I tell you that they have elevated themselves above God? They were making their dens. They were making the caves. And the crazy thing about it, it worked the first time or two. Just like when I took this thing off. It didn't give me the first night. It didn't give me the second night. But I woke up that one morning and was like, oh my God. So I mean, think about the, the things in our lives. Maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's your wife. Maybe it's your kids, your job, your education. Man, there's all sorts of stuff we can elevate above God. Now, when I say that we elevate things in our lives above God, it's not that God is not on the throne anymore. He is and will forever be. But maybe just not the throne of my life. Amen? Amen. And it ain't got nothing to do that he doesn't love you anymore that he doesn't care for you anymore, but he gave them over to the enemy because <clears throat> there's something that he wanted to do in their life. And that is to remove those strongholds and show himself as provider, as sustainer, as redeemer, and in every area. Because it's easy to trust God in, 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 in an area of our life, but maybe not in our whole life. So this is where we're at. Starting in uh, Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 3. It says, So it was, whenever Israel had sown, that the Midianites would come up, also the Amalekites and the people of the east would come against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock in their tents coming in as numerous as locusts, both they and their camels were without number. They would enter the land to destroy it. So can I ask you in your own life, do you feel like everything that you try to sow, the enemy comes to destroy? I've been there. Amen? Amen. But you know the thing about it is here you've got God's people that's basically turned away from God. And it wasn't in the bold sense of saying, God, I'm the provider now. But as far as it's just a routine, if we get to where we elevate ourselves, and you know the reality of the situation, I mean, I'm not bringing up here bringing a word, but brother, I'm just like you. I'm just like you. I'm just like you. I'm just like you. I'm just like you and everybody in this room. So I mean, the quicker that we come to the conclusion that we're all the same, the better off we'll all be. Because I mean, as far as in the book of Judges, it's just a, a routine of God's grace and mercy and us turning our backs on Him. His grace and mercy us turning away from him. So, I mean, there's a lot to learn right here. I mean, if you can identify with it. If you can't, pray for me because I need your prayers. Amen? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're wore out. Every time they sow the garden, the enemy comes and destroys it. And I'm talking about they come in and you can't even count them. And it's like, that hey, no. <laughs> so, I mean, starting in verse 6 right here, it says, So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Start in verse 7. And then it came to pass, 
So think about this. This is God's children. Yes, things are wrecked. The enemy is all up in the camp. Things are getting destroyed. They finally cry out to the Lord. And then it comes to pass. So what is it in Zechariah uh, 1, verse 3? Return to me, and I'll return to you, declares the Lord. So I mean, the beautiful thing about this, if this could possibly be you, all we have to do is acknowledge, hey, this is where we're at. And then we can return to the Lord. And the scripture says his promise is that he'll return to us. So uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 7, it says, And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Midianites, or cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel, who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt. I brought you out of the house of bondage. Verse 9, I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you. And I drove them out before you. And I gave you their land. The understood subject in every bit of that, I being God. God delivered you. God drove them out, and God gave you their land. Now, can I just tell you, well, let's read verse 10. It says, Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. So, I mean, they cried out to God. God sent a messenger, if you will. And he said, Let's recap here. I delivered you from Egypt. I redeemed you. I gave you the land. But how easy it is to forget. No. I, I was at the battle. Yeah. I got that land. So it is. Oh, it was a battle. You ought to see me out there. <laughs> but I mean, keeping it real, though, do we give God the glory for the blessings that he's blessed us with? You know, I, I mean, people people go, Joel, how did you, you know, beat addiction? I didn't. It's by the grace of God. Amen. So, I mean, you know, people, well, when did, when did, when did you make the decision? I mean, what, what was the dividing moment? I was like, I mean, uh, 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 uh. I mean, all I can say is when God said, Joel, you need to forgive, my life changed. It wasn't my idea. It was God. And get to know him through this, this Bible right here and the message and to understand that that message is all about, hey, I didn't deserve it, but he loved me so much that he wanted to come rescue me. What's why? Why, God? He was like, just because I love you that much. Amen. And it's, it is nothing that you did, have done, or will do that will change the simple fact that I love you. That was the hardest thing for, for me to believe about the scriptures. It really was. So starting in verse 11 of uh, Judges chapter 6. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was an Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abizrite, while his son Gideon, now listen to this, Gideon threshed wheat, where? In the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. So, I mean, he's like, he got this thing figured out now. He's like, all right, not the den, not the cave, the wine press. That's what it is. I can do it in the wine press, and the enemy is not going to come in and destroy it. So here he's still stuck in the revolving door trying to make it happen on his own. Amen? Yeah. 
and he's got it figured out this time. Verse 12. In the midst of all this, the Lord shows up and says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. So we were talking about the names of God um, earlier. So, so I want to say, all right, hypothetically speaking, is your life under attack? Maybe you're trying to do things on your own. The scriptures already says if we return to him, he'll return to us. So as far as imagine if you pray to God, and then he looks at you and says, you mighty man of valor. What are you talking about? Hold on now. I'm in the, I'm in the wine press. You know, press some wheat. You know, shh, hold it down a little bit. Because if they hear, they're going to come get everything once again. In the midst of his disobedience and him trying to do things all on his own, God shows up and says, you're a mighty man of valor. Now, I want you to think about that word valor and what the depth of that means. It means that you're able. I, I love the translation of words back to the Hebrew. Because that able, I mean, for y'all, it was like, that's how it was for me. Able. You know, you know what else it means? It doesn't say that you're a guard. It says you're a special guard. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute, church. You're able. You're not just a, a guard. You're a special guard. You're not like everybody else. You're higher than anybody else. And that word also means that you're not just a warrior. You're a mighty warrior. So I mean, here Gideon is, in the midst of him trying to make things work on his own, and the enemy continued to destroy everything that he, that he puts his hand to, and then God shows up and says, you're not only able, you're a special guard, and a mighty warrior. Now, if you don't get that about yourself, you'll probably never go to war. And if you're not going to go to war, you probably ain't winning the battle. Does that make sense? So as far as God looks at you, He says you're able. You are able. You are a Special guard, and I have to think about the special forces. Well, I'd love to do something like that. And a mighty warrior. So if you don't get that, you're going to miss out on why. So it says, Gideon said to him, starting at verse 13, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are the miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. It says, Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Have I not sent you? Matthew 28, 19. Can you pull that up for me? Matthew 28, <clears throat> starting in verse 19. Will you go? 
I need you to go. Now, now, you got to look at this in verse 15. He, he said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. He's still trying to do it on his own. Still trying to do it on his own. The next verse, And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midians as one man. Verse 22 says, now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. <clears throat> Verse 24. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. And to this day, it is still in Oprah of the Abyssalites. You know, in uh, verse 23 and in verse 24 right there where it says, uh, the Lord is peace, that's where we get Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. You know what it also means? The absence of war. So church, when I ask you, do you feel like the enemy has come upon you? Can I ask you, have we put strongholds in our own life? Am I, am I leaning on my job more than I am the God who provides? It's not hard to do that. And it's not, it's not like, you you know, you put your bitches on one morning and say, all right, well, this is how it's going to be. I'm going to get on the throne. God, if you don't mind taking the back seat, I'll holler at you when I get back. It's not that we would be that bold to do that. I mean, maybe, maybe not. But for the majority of us, I would say we just sort of... And, and you know what really don't help at all? Brother, you're doing such a great job. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Seriously, that, that don't take but a half a second to happen. But, I mean, have we created strongholds in our lives? We can't give the devil credit for that now. Not a bit. Scripture says that the children of Israel did that to themselves. The dens, the caves, the way of protecting themselves from the the attack of the enemy. Don't take me a second to get there. And we'll be worshiping creative things versus uh, the creator. But you know the beautiful thing about it? If that is you, what's God saying to you? My, my two favorite questions is one, what's he saying? And what are we doing? Because the beautiful thing about God's Word, it challenges us all. Just like it has with me this week. First from my doctor. Then in my wall. And as I, as I read the scriptures here, I'm saying, I've been there. I don't want to go back. But I mean, the reality of the situation, when I tell you my walk is... It's a constant evaluation. And, and it's not that I mean to, to slide God off the throne of my life. It's just that sometimes I'm looking this way, and then I look back this way, and it's like, what in the world just happened here? And then I focus on this area, and then it's like, oh, my God, what in the world's going on here? So, I mean, when I, when I come in and I say, hey, you know, how is everybody? We can be in rest for 40 years. They were. Things were great. Mm -hmm. While well, I'm constantly building the strongholds. 
in my own life where I'm, I'm elevating myself above other things, and that's the Creator. So the beautiful thing about it is all we have to do, if this is you, is return to Him, and He'll return to you. Thus saith the Lord. So, I mean, the reality of the situation is the, the enemy had, had come upon the Israelites. And it's really no different than in Mark chapter 5, where Jesus comes across the sea, and this man comes running at him. And Jesus said, what's your name? And the man's response was, legion, for they are many. And a legion is over 2,000 evil spirits. So, I mean, you have to ask yourself, did he get them all in one place? Were all these strongholds developed in one instant? I don't know. I would venture to say that it was probably a progression. But I mean, that's how it ends up in my life. You do it the first time and you get away with it. You do it the second time come to the understanding that you are different than everybody else. Praise God. Next thing you know, four, five, six, and then you look up one day and the enemy looks like a swarm of locusts. If we can only walk and truly trust in the Lord, knowing that that army is encamped around you if you're a child of God. So the beautiful thing about it you know, the, the scripture says that an angel of the Lord appeared to him. And Gideon said, hey, stay right here. I'll be right back. So he went and got a goat and some unleavened bread. And he come back and he, and he laid it on the rock. And the angel of the Lord touched it with his staff. Woo, just like that, it was engulfed in flames. And the scripture says, and the angel of the Lord left. You know what the difference is? about today and that day when God speaks to you he says I ain't going nowhere I'll be right here yeah you've heard from me and I'm not leaving I'm staying right here because the scripture says that he'll never leave you He'll never forsake you. Amen. Amen. So I just want to challenge you. Where are you at today? Truly in your relationship with the Lord. And Todd, you got a you got another song that uh, that you want to play for us? These altars are wide open. If you need somebody to pray with, I'd love to pray with you, but, but don't feel like you can't go to the throne yourself if you can. But I uh I picked this song out. And uh, my prayer is that, uh, that God would just speak to us. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. And I thank you for the examples that you give us in your word. And Father, I just uh, I pray for the revelation and thank you for it. Lord, if I put something in my life that's, uh, that's elevated above you. And Father, if I have, Lord, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, that I would uh, truly put it back in its rightful place. And Father, just uh, truly make you Lord of my life. Because Father, you're the one that delivered me out of, the, out of Egypt. You're the one that gave me their land. God, you're the one that broke the chains of addiction in my life, God. It wasn't me. And for that, I'm thankful. So, Lord, uh, help me to return to you, God, so that you will return to me. Lord, I need you, and we need you. Father, if I was uh, one lost, I pray that today they would uh, be found. If there's one that feels like they've run out of grace, Lord, let them know that where sin abound, grace abound even more. Father, I pray that you'll let us all know that you still have plans for us. Regardless of where we're at, where we've been, today we can return to you. So, 
Father, draw on our hearts. And we'll forever give you all the honor and glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
know. Thank the Lord he doesn't turn his back on us. Thank the Lord he, uh, he sent his son Amen. to rescue us from ourselves. Amen. Amen. Um, if y'all will be seated, I got a, so how, Brother Hal? Right here. He, uh, we've got a, uh, a neat study called Financial Peace University fixed to get kicked off. And Hal, if you don't mind elaborating on it, you come on up if you want to. For those of you that weren't here uh, last week, uh, we announced that we're going to have uh, a new class of Financial Peace University uh, starting on the 20th. We announced last week it was going to start on the 13th, but um, Robbie has some people in his discipleship class that were interested. And, uh, so we're going to push it out a week so that uh, so that those folks <laughs> so that those folks can, can uh, come to the class as well. Um, Financial Peace University is all about getting your money under control and handling it that the way that the Bible teaches us that we should handle His money. It's God's money. It's not yours. Okay. So um, we have some. We have a little video that we're going to play for you that give you some of the highlights of the class. Um, we'd love for you to come and see us. It's at 6.30 Wednesday, starting on the 20th of March, and it's a nine-week class. So we'd love for you to come. So, thank you. you play the video? 20 years ago. And now today we've had over one and a half million families go through this course. This is the place where we start happening to our money, where we start aiming our dollars at our goals. you got to make your money behave. You work too hard to get to the end of your life and be broke. There's a massive group of people out there trying to sell you stuff. They want to interrupt your plans. Don't cash out your 401k. I know your 401k looks like a 201k. Remain calm. The only people that get hurt on a roller coaster are those that jump off. God's all in this thing. He's all about fixing you. He's all about fixing me. There's a redemption story built into this whole thing. And every time I give, every time I understand I'm not an owner, I move along that spectrum from selfish to selfless. Now, this is a boot camp. I'm your coach. I've had some good coaches, and they lift me up a time or two, but it caused me to go places I couldn't go otherwise. You change your life when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, where you say, I had it. This is how you get out of debt. You got to run for your life. You got to run, 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 run. You got to bust it. You got to go, and your life depends on it. What would happen to the kingdom of God if the people of God were out of debt? How much of this world could we as believers change?